justice blinded, freedom dying, our fears were coming true. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy 222 on this incredible October Indian summer day here in Kelowna. It's going to be 20 degrees. It's wonderful. So thankful. Thankful that you've joined us here. Join me uh, on Eagle Eye Prophetic Perspectives with Art Lucier and friends. I do have a friend in studio today, and I am Art Lucier. And... um, of course, this program is mainly to bring perspectives for our intercessors on what to go for, what to pray for, what to agree with, and to understand even us as an apostolic, prophetic, fivefold company in the nation, this Revival Reformation Alliance, what we're contending for, and how you how you need to pray for us. I want to start off with a scripture this morning, uh, this afternoon. And hi, everyone. Hi, Bridget. Hello, Catherine. Yeah, love the music. I have to put one of my songs on there because we keep getting flagged on YouTube or Facebook. Mutes us. you good afternoon. Yes, my fellow warrior. Love you, man. Kathy, bless you, Art. And so thankful for these eagle eyes. I can't believe that we've been doing this for like a year and a half already. Basically, I've not missed many weekly programs bringing you a different perspective, a prophetic perspective. Sometimes it's stretching to some. Um, hello, Steve. And uh, But I feel compelled to connect with you. I have a scripture verse to start with today that might set some things here, set some things off. The scripture verse that many of you know well uh, is... John 10, 10, and uh, it says a thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. This was That was Jesus' words. And Jesus says, continues on in 10, 10, but I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. That's, to me, what the kingdom of God is all about. 
When you come into the kingdom and bust out of simply settling for religiosity on a Sunday morning, don't get me wrong. I agree in meeting weekly. Do not forsake the assembling of one to another. Uh, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 16, 14. This famous scripture verse is uh, quite often <clears throat> described, the, the uh, which is quoted, John 10, 10. Jesus describes the outcome and the difference between light and darkness. And I believe there's a great, as great darkness is starting to manifest in the earth, God's got a plan. And he wants to bring life and life abundantly. Where do we find it? Well, I believe that for too long, the enemy has stolen and destroyed much of what is dear to Canadians and to God himself. Family, foundations, and freedoms, of course, are all at stake in this nation. But we are here to declare that the tide and the season are now shifting. The tide is turning. We believe that. Despite what you see and what media may portray or what a government official will randomly say. Now, I want to go back to something. Speaking about John 10.10, 10, there's re one of the reasons I brought that up is um, if you had the pleasure, and I did, of, of, of watching the much-anticipated uh, Super Bowl back on 2-2-2020. That was February 2nd of 2020. Um, if, you if you watched it and if you remember halftime, halftime was interesting. It was 10 to 10. And immediately I thought of John 10, 10 in the war. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus comes that you might have life. And I've described it this way. Jesus is the opposite of communism. Communism is the far opposite of Jesus. There's lots of people today that don't want communism, but they don't understand that they need Jesus. Now, um, speaking about that score of 10-10, quickly into the second half, actually the Chiefs were behind 10-20, to 20, if you remember. It did not look good. Bob Jones had prophesied that when the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, there would be this transformation, shift, restoration of the apostolic foundations of God's church and his kingdom. This was a big deal. To me, there was a lot on the line. Now, some people would say you can't base destiny of a nation on a, uh, on a game. Absolutely not. But what would we desire? Were we ready or was the church calling out for what God's government is supposed to look like? Or were we going to settle into this next season with just our Sunday morning religiosity? Okay, so <clears throat> uh, it didn't look good when the Kansas City Chiefs were down to 10 to 20. But some of you know that they came back and won 31 to 20. Now, I've got a little picture that was brought up here. I want to show you uh, a little picture here uh, that uh, I forget his name that he made, uh, but it was about the apostolic chiefs coming forward. Bob Jones's prophecy. By the way, that it was the Kansas City Chiefs' second win. It was the Kansas City Chiefs' coach, 222nd win. And Bob Jones had prophesied it 25 years earlier. When the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, you will know that revival is about to come. God is raising up his apostolic chiefs. That was on 0202 2020. Uh, that's a palindrome number, which is reversible. But also notice the four twos. Well, I'm excited to talk about the shift and the change and about this. Well, <clears throat> uh, what I see is a shift in the last four, three years here in Canada. Four years. It would be four years ago. This month, where we were preparing for North Battleford, we came together an unheard of 10 days uh, in a place that was minus 17 degree weather in a very small town of 20,000 people, two hours away from the major airport, but yet 1,000 people would show up for 10 days straight. One of those people who showed up was a is an apostolic leader who is coming into his own, a friend of the house. Um, 
a, a regular on the Revival Reformation Reset. I really call him an apostolic teacher who has a prophetic edge. I want to welcome to our show, he's no stranger here, Mark Brisbois, buddy of mine, Mark. Fantastic. Hello. Welcome to on yet another edition of Eagle Eye Prophetic Perspectives. Do we have some prophetic perspectives for our viewers today? What's going on, Mark? Yeah, well, yeah. let me let me throw out a couple of things. It's interesting, you know, even that you're mentioning the apostolic with regards to me. I remember, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, I did an event in northern uh, Ontario. Dennis Wiedrich was doing the worship with Joanne McFadder, and the speakers were myself and Bob Jones. And at that event, Bob Jones, uh, he often would minister to people and and he would uh, he would designate he would talk about the fivefold ministry using his head, and he would talk about this finger representing the prophetic, um, this finger representing the evangelist. This is the pastor, the teacher, and he talked about the thumb, which touches all, as being the apostolic. And at that time, he gave me a prophetic word. He said, "You've been operating." And this is the term he used. I'd never heard this before. He said, "You've been operating." as the inspired priest, and, and he, he went like this, the inspired priest, the, the prophet teacher, the teaching prophet, the pro prophetic teacher, you know, that, that thing. He said, but he said, but this is coming along in your life. The apostolic is developing. And he said something to the effect that the seal of your apostolic authority will be love. And in sign language, this means uh, I love you uh, or something like that. So I thought that was very interesting. And so anyway, that's been coming, and I've been watching the shift from a largely prophetic teaching-oriented person into, into something else, and it's amazing how your sense of values start to shift, and you start to give more weight to certain things, uh, other things more than, than previous your previous motivations. But I always felt uncomfortable when people would refer, me, refer to me in, as an apostolic or an apostle, and the first time I didn't feel awkward about it was, was a week and a half ago. Uh, I had a friend of mine, missionary from Guatemala, speaking in our church. And he felt at that time he was, he was going to say something. And he mentioned me and he said, Pastor Mark. And he stopped himself. He said, you know what? I feel I was going to say, uh, I he said, I feel uncomfortable using that term. I feel like I need to say Apostle Mark. It's the first time I, I didn't feel awkward about it. Like, like it was that it wasn't somehow illegitimate. And so I, I, I bless you. I, I accept the, the fact that, you know, these things are, are developing and uh, they're coming up in us. And, um, and so let's, uh, from there, let's just say a couple of things about the apostolic. Uh, I love that word that uh, Stacy Campbell gave some years ago with the eyes and wings conference. And she just, she described, she said this phrase, where to go, and how to get there. And I love that terminology because to me it is it addresses the two significant things that are necessary for a mission-oriented church, which is where are we going? We're asking the question, where are we going? But then the second major and the prophetic largely answers that. You know, the thus saith the Lord, this is what I'm gonna do, this is this is what I'm you know, uh, this is about to unfold, da 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 da. But the question is how to get there. And here's the problem we have. We love the prophetic in terms of it saying this is what's coming, but we forget that we have a role. We always have a role in what's coming. And God does nothing unless he reveals it to its prophets. But also, you know, uh, he's building through the church. Ephesians 3, 10, through the church, the manifold wisdom is being made known to principalities and powers. And so, so there's an active element in what's happening right now in us in in the church, and uh, and that has that is the thing that really is orienting my life right now. I'm feeling like I'm seeing what God is wanting to raise up. I refer to this all the time. It's from the Psalms, part of it, is Psalm 24. Uh, the generation of Jacob, those who seek His face. I believe that when Romans 8 is talking about the manifestation of the sons of God, he's referring to the generation of Jacob, of those who seek his face, those who say, when you said to seek my face, my heart said, your face, Lord, I will seek. And so I'm looking for 
Uh, yes, different initiatives, different truths, different structures, but primarily a different quality of believer. And so I believe when God is saying he's going to do this and this and this, he needs, he always needs a, a quality of believer. The evangelist is very fond of saying, you know, the, 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 the fields are white to harvest. Listen, I agree, but that, that's never been the issue. The fields have always been white for harvest. There's always a harvest available in every generation. But what Jesus followed that up with is pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. The challenge is do we have a quality of laborer able to, to harvest the harvest in a significant way that, that brings fruit, that creates fruit that remains, that ministers the gospel in such a way that there's not an immediate falling away, that there, there is longevity. You know, the uh, Charles Finney kind of numbers where his retention rate was just through the roof. The, the quality of the harvesters is the missing ingredient. As a leader in the church, when I look around, when I think about starting new churches, when I just had a, a request come across my desk the other day, somebody's looking for a senior pastor for a particular church. And I'm thinking, I can't think of anybody suitable that could bear the, the weight of that role and that responsibility and take the vision further than it can be. I can't think of anybody who's ready to step into that role right now. Not that there isn't somebody out there, but the dearth that we have is of <clears throat> people who can handle the warfare when they step out into the work of the kingdom. And, uh, and so this is the trajectory that I'm on, is I'm believing God for a whole different quality of Christian, a different quality of believer. And, uh, and so to that end, and you know, feel free to step in any time, Art, otherwise I'll, I'll just keep chatting. But uh, you're good there. Well, yeah, I'm I'm good here. You know, you can you can pause, or you can uh, you can cut off a statement, and and then I can ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I, I just might let you go. But uh, at some point, I'll say, hold, hold hold it, hold it. Yeah. So you know, let's go back to Bob Jones's word. Yes. When the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, Apostol when the Kansas City Chiefs, the Apostolic Chiefs would come forward. Have just a, a real honest question. You know, have you been seeing something of the fulfillment of that? Uh, I, I do. Uh, you know, and I've seen it a long time coming. Just as to give an example, part of, the, part of the litmus test for me on the quality of believers is what is the body and what is the general population of church pastors and leaders? What are they ready for? What kind of preaching, what kind of word, what kind of challenges? I, I, I do a, a personal discipleship class, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's a, love the material. It's great. I did it at Christ for the Nations some 20 years ago. And I remember trying to get it out to the church, to the body of Christ. And the response I got over and over from pastors was, was this is too harsh. This is too hard. This is too difficult. This is too honest. This is too, you know, in your face truth. Uh, and, and uh, I mean, it was disappointing at the time, but I realized that, you know what, people want a much softer gospel. They don't want responsibility. They, they don't want to be challenged around pride. They don't want to be, uh, they'd rather, you know, when, when you're the message you need every day is I need forgiveness. I need forgiveness. Tell me I'm loved. Tell me I'm loved. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. Tell me I'm loved. Don't put any pressure on me. Don't put any demands on me. Uh, that's a that's an immature church. That That's a church that's not ready to tackle harvest. But I'm seeing something changing. I'm seeing an aptitude, a hunger, a thirst for a message that's transformative that's going to hit at the core of the selfishness and the flesh and the pride of man in significant ways. To me, that's a tremendous characteristic that will precede revival. When the church is ready for the fullness of the word of God, not only the goodness of God, but the severity of God, you know that they're ready to enter into maturity. When you can start chewing your meat and not complaining about 
you know, how, how tough it is. Uh, you're, you're ready, you know, for something more than, than dessert. So that to me is a significant marker. And I believe uh, I'm seeing that across the board in many different ways. You're seeing that across the board. So we really, really connected in 2018. You joined us on the stage for 10 days in North Battleford. We went to St. John, Battleford, Canada, contending for the apostolic foundations that are biblical, but that Canada may have rejected. And we know that 70 years ago, uh, PAOC in Canada rejected the notion of apostles and prophets for today. We know that. Now, when I say PAOC, I'm not talking about a person. So please don't think I'm hating on anyone, okay? Um, we can talk about belief systems, denominations who believe this and that. I'm just saying that's that's just a fact. And they doubled down on, on it 50 years later in 2002. Mark, we went with a team in 2019 of September, repenting for the rejection of the apostles and the prophets, fivefold ministry, um, as well as some other things. It was six months later that Bob Jones's word is fulfilled about the ap about apostolic chiefs coming forward. Now this is a prophetic program, so I dig into stuff and I look and like I look at correlations. Okay, um, you know, back to what we see. Have we been seeing this? You you say yeah. You you talk about litmus test fine, but you know, are you at all encouraged? At, at, you know, these gatherings that have happened and that are happening and about the possibility of the apostles being <clears throat> coming forward, you know, and are they needed and why? And we're going to also talk a little bit about, you know, the kingdom versus just the church and apostolic government. But, you know, uh, maybe I said a couple things in there. I certainly did. Right. But uh, are you encouraged in the last four years? Uh, I, I'm I'm totally encouraged, you know, um, and again uh, along the same track. Not only not only the language, um, but in in all kinds of spheres of the church. Not only are you know speaking in tongues, the gifts of the spirit, fivefold ministry being accepted, but there are there are there are other things. For example, I uh, I'm I'm preparing to do an event in March, April in Iowa with a pastor, we were doing a uh, little Zoom call, him and I and Dean Briggs the other day. And Dean was Dean was uh, 20 minutes late because he mixed up his time zones. And, uh, and as we started to talk, uh, I started to talk about some deep things that are in my heart. And it was amazing, uh, the hunger in this pastor and the connectivity to the material that I was bringing to him was off the charts. I just came back, flew in this morning from Denver. Uh, I was I was there for a few days, met with a bunch of pastors. Again, the level of agreement, the level of of understanding, like the water table of you know the the uh, rank and file maturity, readiness to understand, capacity, capacity to understand, is just going up and up and up. And so that to me is is the most encouraging sign that things that I couldn't talk about five years ago, ten years ago, are now being just this. It's 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 kind of like when the internet hit mainstream. Yeah, the the techies and the the adventurous people were the first ones to get email and start talking about the World Wide Web. But eventually, you get to this time where where there's this threshold of uh, critical mass that hits the market. And the whole, the center part, you know, the bulk of the population starts to endorse and taste and step into this. I see that happening with material that was sort of edgy, uh, you know, difficult, uh, elusive, uh, maybe uh, uh, un unattainable for some people. It's coming into the rank and file. That is a sign of maturity. And... Uh, but let me let me shift into something here because I wanted to talk. I know we, part of what we wanted to do is talk a little bit about these Alberta linked events, but in general, these are ecclesia or apostolic events, and what distinguishes them 
from other events, it's that they're, uh, they're, they're for your participation. They're not a guy on a stage lecturing a bunch of people sitting down. You know, there's a scripture in Matthew 15, 8 to 9. It says, these people draw near to me with their mouth but they're, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. That scripture has a very specific uh very specific application to a certain kind of Pharisee who doesn't doesn't really love God, but it also has a bit of a lesser application to us as believers. And it asks this question, is how authentic is our worship? How authentic is our worship? Now, you understand this very, very well, Art, but the frustration that I've had for a long time is you go into a lot of churches and, and there's just, just a, I mean, the, it seems like the rank and file of the body of Christ doesn't know how to worship God. They don't know how to seek him. I had a friend who was a uh, teacher uh, on staff at Christ for the Nations, and he was sharing with me one day. He said, he said, I decided to do something with my class because I realized here's the class is full of Christians. Most of these kids have grown up in church. And they know how to sing. They know how to make prayers and petition. They know some of the, you know, the, the specifics around doing those things, but they don't know how to seek the Lord. And so he said, I decided I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a class and for half an hour to 40 minutes, I'm going to seek the Lord in front of them. Just me, myself, to show them the difference between seeking the Lord and participating in a worship service or a song service or a typical prayer meeting where there's a certain kind of rote prayers or people taking their, their turn at making petitions to the Lord. And so he kind of goes into a, a James chapter four lament and seeking, weeping, you know, uh, groaning in the spirit, going after God. And, uh, and I was, I was kind of stunned when he was saying that because I was thinking, yeah, this is totally there's an element of this. If you you go to into 99% of churches, you say, okay, listen, we're not going to use the worship team. We're going to have a guy play a keyboard, but we're just going to, for the next hour, we're going to seek the Lord. You want to talk about awkward? You want to talk about silence? The church wouldn't know how to respond to that. Now, if we had a worship leader up there, we do an upbeat song. We say, okay, everybody, let's clap our hands. Well, we can do that. Okay, let's, if you feel like it, why don't you raise your hands? People are raise their hands. And, and you know, um, maybe something really odd happens and somebody starts dancing. And then we do a five-minute teaching on this, the appropriateness of dance. <laughs> that kind of limited worship is leaving and a capacity to seek the Lord, to enter in, to participate. I, 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 like, I like to contrast it this way. You know, when young kids, we put them into sports, they start to play soccer. If you've ever watched a bunch of four or five-year-olds playing soccer, it's like bumblebees. You know, the, the ball goes here and they just, they run around and there's adults and parents and coaches yelling from the sidelines saying, kick the ball here, come over here, stand here, do this. And that's kind of, that kind of elementary, uh, uh, level of of playing soccer is kind of the equivalent of the church we had 20 years ago where you you always had to tell people what to do nothing was legitimate or done appropriately unless you you were told okay do that let's all say the name of Jesus let's all pray the lord's prayer it's like it's like what's changing and what's exciting about what's changing is people are, are developing an authentic relationship with the lord and they know Increasingly, they're learning how to respond to him when we're in a service. You know, uh, I think how tragic that that Christians who've been in the church 20 years would come to a church and hear people weeping and groaning and calling out to the name of Jesus and, and loving on his name. And there's, there's no song to sing and would feel totally awkward and out of their element. Like they wouldn't know what to do. That is a tragedy that most Christians or a high number of Christians could not to be put into a scenario like that and be comfortable and know what to do, know how to be in his presence and respond to him organically, naturally. 
to me, that's one of the things that's changing. There's there's coming, there's growing, there's developing a maturity uh, in the in a people who can organically, naturally encounter God in a service that's not completely orchestrated and know what to do and how to respond to Him. To me, that is a that is a, that is what these events are based on. If you if you have a don't have a people that know how to interact with God and have to be told, okay, genuflex here, let's jump up and down, let's lift our hand, let's all say this phrase together, let's, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm excited that there, our gatherings are changing because the people who are gathering know what he wants and know how to respond to his presence. So do you believe that this is one of the shifts of the apostolic chiefs coming forward? Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, if I didn't make that clear, yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Maturity. Yeah. The, the the apostles are are putting a demand on the people. It's not enough for you to just stand there and sing the song because the words are up on the wall. You know, if I if I was trying to woo a woman and I I all I could do is say to her the things that my friend wrote down for me the other day, she wouldn't feel like it's a very authentic relationship. You know, <laughs> yet it seems we do worship like this and think nothing of it. What we have is we have we have tailored relationships with people who don't know how to have a relationship. So we're telling them what to say, when to say it, how to say it. And then we say to them, now say it with more passion. That's not maturity. That's immaturity. But uh, people are crossing a threshold because of the apostolic pull to be authentic, to have a real relationship with God, and to, to they're being challenged to know how to respond to his presence and uh, and love him from their own hearts with their own words. Okay. So when did you kick up Alberta Link? What was the was the first one right after our first battle for Canada? What was uh, that? When you, I remember when the, it, it was it was the the weekend when the shutdowns for for uh, COVID happened, like that they happened on the Monday. Oh, in twenty twenty, it, it was that weekend. We had the first one in Spruce Grove, Alberta. We had about uh, 250, 300 people show up. Um, Dennis Wiedrich brought an amazing apostolic word for the for the Church of Alberta in relationships to its role with Canada. It was, it was phenomenal. Oh, wow. And, uh, and mm -hmm. we've done like five or six events since then. And each one, again, it's what's, what's so great about them is the mean level of maturity in the room where you're finding people who just know how to pray, who know how to really offer themselves to the Lord and what, what's happening is something in the spirit is opening up and God is actually beginning to extend the scepter of authority to a people to say, listen, you've been under a tutor before. You've been under a form of guidance, a form of law, a form of obligation, but I'm giving you an authority to speak in my, my name and to, uh, to exercise uh, um, or influence over a region, over the province. And I believe this is what's coming up. This is what the apostolic is bringing. And maybe these events uh, and the, the fact that they're not so odd, strange, and people are coming to them, enjoying them, and knowing how to fit in is a sign of a maturity that's growing, which I believe is correlates with the apostolic rising up. Okay, so I got a I got a couple statements. Maybe we'll do them as questions and see what you have to say about them. Just for some explanation, even about, okay, what does that look like for the apostolic chiefs to come forward? What does it look like for even, what does it look like to shift the church as far as even just the apostles coming forward? What changes? <clears throat> now, uh, I'm going to say it like this, apostolic government, kingdom government, um, prepares people for harvest to influence society beyond their local church. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, it's a, it's a natural outgrowth of, of creating competent people. I was just telling a story the other day of, of a person, a Christian that I know, who's now being doing some social work, but now is being sought, off, sought after by the city government 
because of the level of competency, intelligence, empathy, and uh, authenticity that's demonstrated in their life. In short, they're a mature Christian, and they're starting to, to have these capacities, and that immediately becomes comes in demand. Influence is always the outcome of spiritual maturity. And, um, and so, you know, by, by default then, the lack of influence the church has had over the last 50 years is because of a depletion, of a, of a lack, of a, a, a lessened, diminished quality of, uh, of, of doctrines of demons that says, listen, we're going to go in the rapture really soon. We don't need to worry about, let's leave the world to Satan. And we're, cause we're leaving, you know, that whole, that whole, ah, uh, it really bothers escapism. me. You know, it's an escapism theology. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, combine that with rejecting what I call the teeth of the kingdom, the apes, the apostolic prophetic evangelists, the apes, APEs of the, the those those three of the fivefold, take the teeth out of the kingdom, escapism theology, and uh, let's let's wave our little white flag on a Sunday morning, hoping that Jesus comes tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there there just there has to be real courage. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and I think this is what's coming. I think you've got people who are stepping out in the marketplace. Like uh, a few years ago, I got challenged by the Lord. I was, I was sitting in the House of Commons and I was listening to some of the discussion going down, down on the floor and the, in the arguments and the, the uh, pithy statements and counter attacks and all the rest of that that was going on on the floor. And I was feeling not only the level of intelligence that was there it was it was pretty witty stuff, but but the warfare, the witchcraft, the sorcery that was involved. You know, people don't realize that sorcery is a work of the flesh, like jealousy. It, it's it's not a religious religious thing. It's a it's a characteristic of fallenness. In the same way, rage, murder, anger, gossip is sorcery is a an innate illegitimate spiritual authority uh, that comes through the the uh, the medium of uh, of fallenness and ambition and pride and lust for power and so I'm seeing this happening on the floor of the House of Commons and I'm thinking man I know how many I don't know how many Christians wouldn't wouldn't be able to stand in the midst of this level of warfare and have any influence have, even make a dent in in a conversation, and yet we just blindly believe we're going to inherit the nations. Uh, and, and you know, this is the theology. Yeah, we may be bad at everything, but one day God's going to come down and wipe them out. No, no, no. What, what Ephesians 3.10 says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is going to be made known to not only creation, but principalities and powers, but mankind. This is happening through the church. God's not just going to give authority to a bunch of people who have never done anything. He's fashioning us into glorious ones. He's fashioning us into influential people who can speak with authority. I mean, Jesus had influence because he spoke with authority. We can't bypass that as the metron or the measure of what he's making us to be. And just hope, well, you know, one day I'm just going to, you know, hit the jackpot and get a position of authority. No, no, no. Authority comes because you deserve it, because you speak with wisdom and, and in, go in godly ways that influence people's minds and hearts, and more and more people are recognizing it. That's how you get influence, not just by, you know, w waving a flag and uh, what do you call, crossing your fingers and <laughs> hoping it's going to happen. I mean, these these are these are real commodities that are growing in our lives. So, um, yeah, it's not just going to one day. What well, one day God's going to turn it all around? He is turning it all, it all around, but through fundamental but realistic changes that are happening in our lives. You know, I see the last four years with the battle for Canada's that have happened. Now we're going into these alliance events, revival, revivalist reformers back to back coast to coast coming, you know, we're, 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 we're going to be there in Prince Albert this Friday doing a prayer strike and meeting with leaders tomorrow night, actually there right in Prince Albert. If you're a leader, 
get a hold of me if you want to come to that. Um, uh, and then in two weeks, we're hitting Prince Albert with these leaders coast to coast. The week before, you're doing a gathering. This is what I this is this this is what I see. I see the apostolic chiefs, the fivefold, and, and let's remember what was rejected in 1952 was the un, was the fivefold ministry as well. It was called the Restoration Movement because it was the restoration of the fivefold. Ministry, which is Ephesians 4.11, where it says Jesus gave gifts to men, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers, to equip the saints, to do the work of the ministry, uh, and to grow on to maturity, uh, mature, not lacking anything, as it says. I wish I would have brought that scripture verse up, but that's what it says. Um, I'm encouraged. I'm excited about apostles and prophets. Pro apostles, uh, pro prophets, uh, you know, evangelists, intercessors, saints, musicians, gathering in these different places. And I want to encourage Canadians, you got to get to these. Yeah. Like these, these are what the Lord is doing. I'm not saying forsake your local assembly. Not, not at all. Um, you need to get to these, you, you, you need it all. Um, and so where are you guys meeting there? It's in a week, right? Or a week or what? Yeah, well, it starts, uh, it's uh, the 20th, so it's eight days, uh, I guess, from now. Thursday, okay. Thursday night in Medicine Hat at First Assembly. And uh, people can go onto uh, the Facebook page, and there's information there. Registration is open. We've got a special deal with the uh, uh, Holiday Inn there. And, uh yeah, it's 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 going to be a great time, and and again, the the exciting thing for me is as I watch the quality. Well, actually, let me let me back up a second. Uh, let me try and think how uh, there there since I became a Christian, I it's like there was so much fear, so much fear. Uh, I would get around people and. And it's like people weren't weren't they didn't know what they were allowed to do in a prayer meeting. They didn't know what they were allowed to do in a worship song. And so there was a very narrow line of what you were allowed to do. And so I remember when I started a, a prayer meeting at our house some years ago when we were living in, in Surrey, and we were just worshiping, and I we started discovering that sometimes. People would just get a leading. I remember one time this uh, one person, they weren't a singer, they weren't a dancer, but they just began to jump up up and down and, uh, and re recite. It was like this rhythmic thing, and it didn't seem to make a lot of sense at the moment, but all of a sudden this atmosphere changed in the room. And I thought, that is, that is so great. That person led out with something that wasn't normal, wasn't they weren't they weren't assigned authority to do it, but all of a sudden it shifted the atmosphere in the room. When I look in the Bible at Phinehas, you remember Phinehas? He was when the nation of Israel is being uh, judged, about to be judged because they're marrying, you know, Moabite women and the rest of that. And this guy comes into camp right at that time with his Moabite woman or something. Phinehas. He's not given any authority. He's not given a memo. He, yeah, he takes his spear, runs, and kills him. And he's celebrated for taking this on himself and doing it. Here's the thing. I love this because the Bible is full of moments when people color out the outside the lines. And there's no, there's no precursor to what gave them the authority to do that. They felt to do something, and they did it, and God celebrated it. You know, David... Of his own accord, he didn't get a word from a prophet. He starts making new instruments, making new instruments and bringing them into the worship of the Lord. The uproar in the church 50 years ago when somebody dared to play a, a, an instrument other than an organ was, was division and chaos and wrath. I mean, you know, because, because the religious spirit had so suppressed and so... So narrowed what was permissible to do if you're a Christian. These are the things we do in church and only these things. Everything else is demonic. Everything else is. But the, 
the scripture is full of people who colored outside the line, who did something for the first time. The woman with the, the alabaster box, nobody told her she should do that. And everybody, most half of the room, three quarters of the room, judged her for doing it. Jesus was the only one who said, leave her alone. Kissing my feet and pouring this ointment over my feet and drying them with their hair. And, you know, this is a good thing. Yet there was nothing on that in pre-endorsed that activity. I'm looking for a people with courage to respond to the leading of the Lord. And and uh, and we we're what's happening in their meetings, in our churches, in our prayer meetings, in our worship times. People out of this organic encounter with God are starting to color outside the lines, and groan and shout and sing and pray and declare and jump around and ex, you know have real encounters with God. How tragic that other Christians would stand by and say, well, this is out of order. We, know, we don't even know what's going on. Nobody's told us we should cry. We have to get permission first. It has to be pre-endorsed. The Bible's full. The guys that, what, what about the guys that came and took the tiles off the roof and opened up and hold the roof? Nobody told them they could do that. And they were the ones that got the miracle. What I'm by saying, the way, Mark, Mark, you have to know that God changed his mind. <laughs> now we're allowed instruments in church, and Brother Nick said drums were banned in some churches. Drums are still banned in some churches, but in a lot of churches, God has changed his mind because now we can bring drums in, and it's pretty awesome. Yeah, um, you gotta have permission. <laughs> I just, you know, and something about that that's so true. King, you know, you talk about David made these instruments. Listen, people, even the temple which is the most sought after piece of property in all the world, the Temple Mount. David, that was David's idea, not even God's idea. David brought it to the prophet and the prophet said, go and build and do all that the Lord has told you to do. God comes to the prophet Nathan that night and says, hey, no, 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 you made a mistake here, Mr. Prophet. Go back and tell David, yeah, did I ever ask for a, a house? Is not the earth my footstool, you know, he goes, but, but you know what, David, your son will build it. I like the idea. Then God came up with the whole plan. God came up with a design, but it was actually in the heart of David. He, you know, it's like, what is in the hearts of Canadians that have been locked up because of our little religious Sunday morning churchianity? In fact, these gatherings, stirring up the spirit, apostles, prophets coming together in these different regional gatherings, I, 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 I tell you unashamedly, apostles, prophets unlock yes. heavens and, and spirit starts to move. And we and all of a sudden people who come and just to to kind of push and receive or maybe get a word. All of a sudden something stirs inside them. Then they go home. They have a dream. So they get permission. They get permission to seek the kingdom, to be yeah. to be to, to, to see their destiny fulfilled. This is what's going on in this time with apost apostolic chiefs coming forward. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's not some grandiose thing that the apostles are now going to sit on a throne. Yes, in kingdoms, there's kings, and we get it, and there's chiefs, but they're actually going ahead, doing the work, busting stuff open. Uh, instead of you know taking holidays, they're outgoing to reserves and places, trying to unlock stuff, trying to convince people that they, we need to come and fight for Canada. You know, um, anyway, that's my little yeah, that, rant. That, that's a great point, you know, and that's really what I was getting at. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And and this is like we are fighting, to me, we are fighting this restrictive, coercive weight that says these three things alone are you allowed to do in church. Everything outside of that, we have to analyze and question and scrutinize Where's that in the Bible? And yet God delighted as he listened to Adam. He said, Adam, you name the animals. You name them. Why, why does God, why did God do that? Why did he give Adam the opportunity to do something creative? Because our God is a creative God and he's raising creative sons and daughters that, that, What's allowable, what's celebrated in heaven, isn't this narrow spectrum of things 
that our forefathers and our fathers' fathers and our grandfathers and our denominations and our culture have said, only these things are approved. Listen, the gate is wide and, uh, and the people of freedom are discovering expressions. I just heard here recently somebody was upset and saying, you know, the dance, you know, when flaggers are flagging and dancing in church, this is challenging. And I'm thinking, yet how many of these people have no problem going to bombastic theaters, watching, you know, uh, beautiful aesthetic uh, events, you know, played out. They go to football games and there's fireworks and all this. We love the pageantry of those things, but somehow it's anathema in church. It's it's accursed. It's it's defiling to the glory and presence of God. No, pageantry is a part of worship. Colors, flags, dance, sounds, creative sounds, new sounds, fresh sounds. Apostolic authority is taking the lid off of the people of God. That's right. And you know what? It's just going to increase. Lisa, Lisa Heap said, we, we dealt with that. We repented of that rejection. You know what we did? In fact, we, in, in many different gatherings, but specifically the ones that we were involved in, in 2019, in Kings Valley, Kings Church, in the first incorporated city, St. John, we repented of the rejection of the notion of the apostolic. Mm-hmm. We repented. We're going forward. We're not making apologies anymore. In fact, you know, um, if you were there, at one of the one of the Alberta links. I, I'm in BC, but I, I very often I find myself at half these events, Alberta links. You mm-hmm. you you have a notion of inviting me. Come and come and check it out. Watch it. But uh, it was in February. I felt led of the Lord. I was actually going up to Rodney Fortin's. I had a word for two twenty, but I was there on two eighteen with you in Calgary. Um, uh, and I took at, at the word of the Lord, this, well, I call it a mantle maker. And I, I felt led to put it on you and declare in front of all of this large gathering as what we see on you, apostolic grace and apostle really to the nations as well as to Canada. You know, what I, I, I'm going to, what, was there any fallout? What, what, what did it do to you? Us dropping a mantle, recognizing, and then we dropped it on Barry once as a prophet, Steve Holmstrom as an evangelist. But talk to me about that moment. We've never unpacked that. Let's do it right here. Let's take a couple of minutes, unpack this few minutes to close off Eagle Eye, you know, about uh, at this gathering, calling, you know, recognizing you as an apostle. Yeah, well, there was, there was no blowback or anything like that. Uh, the one subsequent thing that's come up is one of the core leaders, he's an older apostolic prophetic leader in, and I just won't say his name, but he asked me uh, a couple months ago, he said, listen, um, I feel we need to do something more. I, I feel, and this is what he said. He said, he said, we need in Alberta you to know that when you blow the trumpet, we'll assemble. We will come. And uh, this is a senior apostolic leader who's 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 a senior to me. I mean, he's older than me. He's, he has more years in ministry, and and I, I really respect his authority. And so uh, he says, I think we should do this as Alberta linked as apostles and prophets and leaders to make sure to do something to recognize that apostolic anointing on your on your shoulders. So <clears throat> I think it's opened something up. I, I didn't feel any negative response. No, no, no. As, as it happens, most times people don't come to me with their complaints. They usually whisper it around in secret places because uh, they usually don't get a, you know. Hey, hey, Mark, we've got a question from Brother Tobias Thiessen. Brother Tobias, good to, good to hear from you. He goes, I believe in current day apostles and prophets. I would be interested to see a prophetic timeline of the prophet or apostle handing down the mantle from one to the next, if you can, or was the mantle picked up mystically? You know, that's a good question. We see Old Testament wise, mantles are handed down uh, like Elijah to Elisha. Elisha actually asked for a double portion. And, you know, the mantle fell to the ground. He picked it up and he took it. Um, Bob Jones, Bob Jones's testimony is that when he was nine years old, the angel Gabriel showed up with a double silver trumpet, blew it in his face, threw a big chunk of bullhide on the ground scared scared bob jones he ran from it for years 
and it was a mantle that was to come down. I believe, Brother Tobias, that the Holy Ghost can just drop in someone's living room. Usually, though, it's laying on of hands, as we see the Apostle Paul in the New Testament actually says, fan in the flame the gift given to you by the laying on of my hands. Now, um, I believe that God's not limited to a man limiting laying on hands, though we do see it. I don't believe God is limited to an actual physical mantle, though we actually do see it in Scripture. I believe that if we try to formulate it, that God will purposely bust out and do something a little bit differently because I do not believe it's about formula. I do believe, like in Jeremiah 1, 5, you know, Jeremiah, God says to Jeremiah, says, listen, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and I called you to be a prophet to the nations. And I believe Jesus has given, as it says, Ephesians 4, 11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints. And, and you know what, if we would just re, just seek the Lord to, to uh, let that gift mature and manifest in our lives and be comfortable, whether you are just, a, a, you're, you're just an, an administrator or a worship leader or an apostle or a pastor or an intercessor, someone who's gifted in, in business, uh, someone who's got money and just, they just love to give money, as it says, actually it's one of the gifts or the graces out of Romans 12. The pay is the same. The pay is the same as long as we're just faithful to use that gift. But back to your question, I don't believe there's a formula per se, you know, and um, I, I don't think so either, Art. You know, uh, I was in El Salvador speaking at a conference one time and this young man afterwards come up and told me he was studying to be an apostle. And uh, uh, I, I wasn't in a position to break it to him, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's not a bunch of courses you can take. Yeah, you and uh, so unfortunately, but you know, let me say this: I think yes, certain things can be handed down. But I remember talking to a global leader whose name you would know, and he said to me, he said, uh, I asked him, I said, you know, has anybody ever laid hands on you to impart you apostolic gifts? He said, Well, Jesus did. And uh, so, you know, he was caught up in a vision. Je Jesus walked into his room and laid hands on him. So I, I think that's, that's certainly one way. Oh, well, <laughs> well, there you go. You know, um, we could talk about that for a little while. You know, um, we might have to talk about that a little bit more as far as the prophetic timelines and perspectives and different ways that people have been visited. Revivalists of the past who have turned the church upside down. It's happening again, Mark. Here we are. We are at an end of an age. It says harvest is at the end of the age, an age. I believe the whole um, religiosity, churchianity age is coming to a close. It's over. It's harvest time. And there's a kingdom age upon us now, a restoration of all things, as, as uh, you know, um, as, as Peter talked about in, in Acts 3.17. Um, at the day of Pentecost until the restoration of all things. And um, while well, he was alone, that's right, Nick, it happens. People can be alone at home. The Holy Ghost is yeah. dropped on them. Absolutely. You know, um, I don't believe there's any certain formula. We do see, though, laying on of hands is a, is a good way. The public gathering. Yes, Mark. You know, one, one caveat, uh, if, if people yeah. are feeling like, oh, God has called me to be a prophet. God has called me to be apostle. I, I want to say this, you know, use wisdom, hold, hold that, hold that, because uh, if he's called you to be a prophet, if he's called you to be an apostle, there's a journey involved in this, and you don't know, you might feel a certain energy uh, uh, and a, uh, a, a truth about that or a conviction that that is true, but it's not real until others say it is, and not just, you know, your mom. But, but, you know, other people, as, as that authority of that gifting starts to develop, people will begin to recognize. If they're not recognizing it, don't put it on your business card. Let others call you that first before you call yourself that. Well, fantastic, Mark. We're out of time. I'm going to let you go. Thank you, sir. Uh, your daughter put the link. 
in the comments. Your daughter, Jennifer, was on here. We'll okay. see you, Bridget, and different ones who are on here. Uh, Nita, uh, Janelle, uh, see you, Mark. And um, we're praying and we're believing we know great grace and fire is going to be on those meetings in Medicine Hat. Um, we can't go to them all, but uh, if you're there in in Alberta, make your way to Medicine Hat. All right, Mark. And right. Uh, we'll probably, yeah, we'll see you next week on the reset, if not before. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, that was that was a great talk. Uh, I'm glad you've all joined us here today. Um, hey, uh, just a do we have a poster for Faith, Fire, Freedom, Prince Albert there? Um, would love to uh, quickly throw one up just as we're closing the program. I got a little announcement, you guys. I'm going to quickly, uh, there's, well, here's a here's a different one, Mo. I'm going to send you this one. I uh, just texted it to you, if you can throw that up. Um, I'm really excited, even though it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of, it's a long drive in, you know, who knows what the weather's going to be like in two weeks from now in Prince Albert. But we're coming back to the Doorway Province. We were listening to the different prophets and apostles speak this morning on the reset. I was, I'm very, very encouraged. It's going to be, it's going to be a bit of chaos. Um, and what's going to start the chaos, whereas we're doing a live reset in the theater there in that large uh, boarding school that is now Kingdom Center. Uh, Canadian Revival Center. and um, But then that night, we're doing a special event to kind of kick off the whole thing before we go into like an open mic all day Friday, all day Saturday. And what the event is, uh, well, we'll see. Is it going to be cold? Is well, We'll see. But here's, here's a little uh, something for you. Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson, who's coming in for the whole weekend, her, Mark Friesen, and my band, we're going to start it off with kind of like a um, a harvest night. We're going to have some truth telling there in the auditorium at 1405 Bishop Pascal Place, which is now the Canadian Revival Center, 7 o'clock on Thursday. Tell your freedom fighter friends to come out. And we're going to be making an altar call leading people to Jesus and that's kind of going to start off our kind of gatherings in the auditorium. Then Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, Sunday morning, seven sessions without scheduled speakers, though all 30 of them would be able to bring a message. And we'll just see who the Holy Ghost lands on. What comes forward, we're believing for uh, uh, an infusion of faith that moves mountains a fire of God that's going to burn bright in the darkness and a level of freedom from addictions, from fears and uh, a freedom from yourself um, is going to come down through the laying on of hands and a visitation of the Holy ghost, the glory of God. We're contending for the well of revival from 70 years ago. Before we go 70 years ago, I, I, I talked about, about how a denomination Many denominations rejected the apostolic, the notion of apostles and prophets in 1952. Uh, let's bring up that one photo. I want to show you what's going on. There's been talk about the, the planet Jupiter. Now, I'm going to bring a whole message in time. I don't quite have it ready. I want to show you where Jupiter is right now. By the way, you've heard talk that Jupiter is as close at, to the Earth as it's been since 1952. When Canada rejected the notion of the restoration movement, healing signs and wonders, apostles and prophets, the uh, you know four years after the fire came down, let me just show you a, a picture though. This is now Jupiter is the king wandering star, according to Jewish tradition, ha, ha, you know, handed down Seth and Enoch. God, by the way, God, God named all the constellations. You read that. In Job 38, he actually, God rebuked Job and saying, can you bind the Pallids? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you lead out the bear with her cubs? Of course, the bear and her cubs is, um, the bear and her cubs, that is Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. That's the big and little dipper. Um, but interesting, since four year, uh, five years ago, since, 
the Revelation 12 woman was fulfilled and Jupiter left the womb. Jupiter is symbolizes the Christ. It's a story in the stars. And Jupiter is the largest planet and he's been doing these really cool visitations amongst all the other constellations where he hasn't done them necessarily before. But one last look at where he is. When you see Jupiter in the night, you'll see Pisces there. Pisces is the two fish joined to the tail. And the path of Jupiter is to split the two fish, which talks about the end times of the good fish and the bad fish. That It says in the end, the fish are gathered and the bad are thrown away. But the, the fish also symbolizes harvest time. I'm telling you guys, it's harvest time. That's what time it is. And we are contending as an apostolic, prophetic, fivefold ministry gathering uh, 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 alliance, uh, really a, uh, a shoulder to shoulder of all these ministries coming together. We are believing for revival, reformation, and for harvest time. So thank you for joining this program. Hope you've been blessed. And um, we'll see you next time. Next time. Remember, uh, Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without first revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. This has uh, been another edition of Eagle Eye, Prophetic Perspectives with Art Lucier. Thank you and um, blessings on you guys. And we'll see you in Prince Albert very soon.